Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is uh, Hiba and I'll be the host for today's event. And yeah, welcome to Spooky Science, which is a girls in STEAM mentor cafe. Uh, so before we begin, I uh, would just like to begin by gratefully acknowledging that Science World is located on traditional ancestral and unceded Musqueam, Squamish and Soilitude village site of Sinop. So today, we will start with a quick introduction from our amazing group of mentors and a hosted discussion. We will then open up for a Q&A session where you can ask more detailed questions. Um, but we also would like to thank SAP for their generous support of these events. Um, our technicians, Madeline and Brian, will be monitoring the chat. And if you have any technical issues, they would be very happy to assist. We ask that you keep comments in the chat and the question section respectful and relevant to all the topics that are currently being discussed. Okay, now it's time uh, to meet all of our mentors. So we'll start by going around and doing a very brief introduction before we jump into the questions. So mentors, um, can I get each of you to let us know your name, job title, and maybe a little bit about what you do and your favorite thing about the spooky season. So on my screen here, I think my first victim for today would be Maria. Go ahead, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Maria Issa. I'm a scientist at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Pathology, which is always known as the, uh, the dead bodies department. And actually, I deal or did deal mostly with live people, but blood. So I'm the vampire lady, and I used to trot blood and blood components all across BC to show kids in schools, and I also did blood research. And I'm the quintessential lab rat, so I really enjoy blood and lab and that kind of stuff. Perfect. Thank you, Maria. Next on my screen, I have Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah. I am a second year student at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. I am also a research assistant for Dr. Anne Cheapton. And so the research that we focus on is cave microbiology. Um, so the study of things that are too hard to see with the naked eye. And we specifically uh, research cave microbiology and bat microbiology. Um, so I get to crawl around in caves and collect samples from caves, which is probably my favorite part of my job. And then I also get to work with bats, which is super exciting. Awesome. Sounds very fun. Uh, Jennifer, you are the next victim that is up. <laughs> um, uh, a victim, how appropriate. Aww. My name is Jennifer and I uh, was a funeral director and Work, managed a funeral home and a crematorium for 15 years. Um, on the cremation side, uh, I love to see the entire process of uh, when a body goes into the crematorium and then comes out, uh, how uh, different aspects and different um, things that you would never expect affect the cremation process and the funeral rites that uh, surround that process. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Athena, you're up next. Hello, everyone. My name is Athena, and uh, I work in the same uh, profession that Jennifer used to work in. I am a funeral director and an embalmer, and uh, I really enjoy helping families, um, the living, but I also really enjoy looking after those that have passed away and taking care of their bodies and ensuring uh, that they're well cared for. Thank you. And then last but not least, we have Vienna. Hi, everyone. My name is Vienna, and I'm a lab manager and PhD student at the Center for Forensic Research and the School of Criminology at Simon Fraser University. And my research is on body decomposition in water. So one of the things that I really like about my work is that I feel like I'm actually producing useful tools and insights for investigators. And I also love being outdoors, doing field work. So you kind of get a bit of both. Uh, doing what I do. 
Awesome. Thank you. So now we'll move on to a couple of questions um, that uh, we have come up for um, for you guys. And uh, mentors, feel free to talk amongst yourself and make it a conversation uh, amongst yourself. We'd love to hear everyone's perspectives. Uh, so my first question that I have, and I'll uh, start with Jennifer, if that's over, if that's all right. Um, so Jennifer, what do you think is the spookiest part of your job? Um, the spookiest part of my job is one time I had to cure the inside of the cremation chamber. So I had to spend the night on the cemetery by myself. Um, and this is a, the largest cemetery in Vancouver, Mountain View Cemetery. So um, the inside of a crematorium, a cremation chamber is like a pizza oven and it's all cement. And so you have to turn it on every once in a while to make the cement hold because we were doing a rush job. So I was in the funeral home by myself on the cemetery all night, turning this cremation chamber on. It was pretty that that tested my uh, I needed a stuffed animal to hug. <laughs> That's definitely fair. Um, and Sarah, oh, Sarah, you, you work with um, uh, in caves, so I'm sure you must have seen some pretty spooky things. Do you yeah, have any, yeah. yeah, that uh, you want to share that's pretty spooky? Sure, we went to a cave in uh, Chilliwack, BC called the Iron Curtain Cave. And at the beginning of October, actually, and we went down in the cave and we're crawling around and crawling under this sort of like rock feature and like on my like my stomach and my back's like hitting against the rock. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I think I'm stuck. <laughs> and so that was pretty spooky. Um, and then also seeing some spooky little critters in some caves can always be interesting. Lots of frogs, surprisingly, in caves. Uh, lots of spiders, that sort of thing. Very cool. I'm not a fan of big, spooky, creepy crawlies, but uh, yeah, I, I admire your bravery there um, for it. And Maria, I'd love to hear, uh, I'm sure you have lots of stories from all of your experiences, and I'd love to hear uh, a spooky part of your job. Well, it was probably not very spooky, but kind of strange. Uh, I was heading off to, I think, Prince George with some a container of blood that I had to fly up to Prince George. So I was trot sitting on the plane. And all of a sudden, before the plane takes off, I noticed that there were these two big burly policemen who were converging on my seat. And I'm going like, what, 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 what? And what had happened is I was carrying the blood in this biohazard container because technically blood is biohazard, right? So somebody on the flight had freaked out and called the cops on me and said, hey, uh, what is this biohazard? So I had to explain to them, look, it's just blood. It actually happened to be my blood in a plastic container rather than in my body. So could you please just let me go because I'm you know, going to schools to teach them about blood. So it wasn't really spooky, but for a while I thought I was going to get thrown off that flight and I was not happy. How often did you carry around your own blood? Oh, pretty much um, every time I, I went to a school because... You know, the quickest blood donor is the one that's right there. And that was usually me. Did you take your own blood? Uh, I, it's kind of hard. I can take my own blood, but the quantities that I needed, uh, I would probably, I'd get somebody else to help me with it. Yeah. Wow. That's putting your all into teaching. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, that's next level. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's like the definition of commitment, basically. <laughs> you really just went all in for it there. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, all right, Athena, I have a question for you. Have you had ever had to do anything at your job that others might find a bit weird, but you love? Um, well, probably embalming would be a bit weird for most people, but I do love it. Um, but I think the weirdest thing that... Um, I ever really had to do that someone might think, oh, uh, was many years ago, there were a lot of feet that kept washing up ashore, which maybe Vienna may have been part of that part. Um, but somebody wanted to bury their loved one's foot and have a full ritual ceremony. And at the time I wasn't as experienced and I thought, hmm, what do we do with this? But yeah, that was the weirdest, uh, 
weirdest service I ever had to conduct was for one foot in a shoe. Was Wait, it a so full burial or? A full burial. At the time, the foot had no long, it was mainly the bones still in the sock, still in the shoe. And it was strange, even for the family, but it was so incredibly meaningful and they needed to do that. And when I actually arrived at the cemetery, I felt very comforted knowing that this family were able to finally say goodbye to the, uh, the family member that they could not find who had drowned. Mm -hmm. that yeah, that closure is so important. Mm -hmm. um, Athena, could you describe yeah, interested in for our yeah, certainly. I can describe um, embalming is the act of uh, preservation, sanitation, and restoration of a human body. Uh, most families who want to view their loved one or who wish to repatriate their loved one to another country um, will require embalming. Um, it's not always needed for local uh, services, uh, depending on time of death, manner of death, uh, but it is something that we would recommend uh, to have a the most pleasant viewing experience for a family. It requires a surgical procedure where chemicals are ingest, injected into the body to preserve the tissues, the blood, and of course, all the organs that are in one's body. Great, thank you. Um, and then Vienna, same question. Have you ever had to do anything at your job that uh, others find might find a bit weird, but you absolutely love? I don't know about the loving part, but <laughs> I do I do enjoy my work. Um, I actually wanted to talk a little more about the feed and water. Um, our lab was involved in some of that. We have been consulted. The coroners actually have produced a really neat map. So if anybody's interested, you can um, go online, go to the BC Coroner Service, uh, Office of the Chief Coroner, and you'll actually see all the feet that they have been able to recover. Um, one thing that people often ask us um, about it is like, oh, is there a serial killer with a foot fetish? And the thing is, no, they're very, it's very unlikely. It's because um, of how natural decomposition works. The shoe actually protects the foot, likewise with the sock. So um, the things that would normally scavenge your body, they can reach your ankles. Um, most of those people are, you know, so if you're somebody who wears ankle socks and like sneakers, um, you're more likely to have your foot found than say if you were wearing uh, high heels because your foot would be largely exposed. And the shoes themselves, you'll notice they're all kind of similar. They're all running shoes with like certain types of foam and other things that give it high buoyancy, which means that it's gonna work as a mini flotation device. So once the body, the foot is disarticulated, it's separated, it's gonna work like a little floaty and shoot the foot right up. Um, so we can find it. So um, uh, one person mentioned that's creepy. Yeah, it can be, it can be considered creepy. Um, in terms of what uh, I do uh, that I think some people find kind of odd uh, when I was doing my field work. Um, so I had put a lot of bones into a lake in the middle of nowhere. And I would round up some friends, we'd get on to a boat and we'd actually row our way, because we can't use motors, it would disturb the yeah. lake content. So we actually row against the wind, rain or shine, even when it's snowing, to get to these bones, to recover them, like pull them up. Uh, and then I would bring them back to the lab to analyze. Uh, and so uh, there were sometimes people who were just walking by and they'll notice all these little buoys, these little floats that I had made. And they're like, oh, what's going on there? <laughs> and I just have to explain to them, oh, I'm just doing a, a little study looking at what's in the, <laughs> what's in the water. <laughs> so I, I think that, um, yeah, some people may be a little freaked out by that, but I, I love being in the water and in nature. So it's, uh, it's not too spooky. Very cool, very interesting, <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, uh, I have a question for Maria next. How did you uh, get started in your career? Uh, what really interested interested you kind of maybe when you were younger um, that led you to, to the very, very awesome career that you have right now? You know, this is, I've been thinking about this. I think I've always liked looking down microscopes or just, you know, 
poking about with stuff. So initially, I thought I was going to be a microbiologist. So I'm, I'm you know, I have sympathies with some of our other mentors here. But um, then microbiology morphed into immunology, and then immunology was sort of it happens in the blood at a lot of times. And so I ended up doing blood and it, it ended up being just totally fascinating. And it, I mean, when you think about it, there's this stuff that circulates through you, right? It carries all the molecules. It carries the food. It carries your oxygen. It cleans up your body. It keeps you functional. Um, and, and then, wow. then Athena goes and exchanges it once we're done. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's we all feed into each other here, really, and and yeah, it was, it's fascinating. It really, is fascinating. So yeah, <laughs> have you ever tried getting blood from funerals? Um, no, the closest I've ever gotten is uh, when we were working on animal blood and getting it from an abattoir or whatever you call it. You know where the animals are killed. We we did get blood from there so at times that was kind of you know it was cool and gross at the same time awesome thank you and that actually leads perfectly into athena um yeah you you connected it right there so same thing how did you get started in in the career that you're in um i actually was working in a hotel at the time and i had no real connection with funerals at all and somebody had uh booked the hotel for a, a memorial service. And uh, in my job then, I was able to kind of help that family. And then I realized, oh, there is this interesting sort of taboo, not a lot of information available, a lot of closed doors and funeral profession. So I spent a lot of time researching and eventually moved and became a, went to school and did this. And then when I was telling my mother, she said, you know, what's interesting is you always used to read the obituaries as a kid in the newspaper when we got the morning paper delivered to our home. I don't know if any of the kids here even know what a newspaper looks like these days. But this is an old paper we used to use. We didn't do it online. Uh, but anyway, she said, you always read them and you'd always ask me questions about uh, you know, who, who this person was or look at this family that had this person. And I didn't quite connect the two, but I think it's always been in me. And um, yeah, I, I can see now how one step led to another to another. And here we are today. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then Vienna, same question to you. How did you get started in your career and what interested you kind of in uh, your journey throughout your journey? It was really in university. I got an opportunity to be part of an archaeology field school, and that changed my perspective on what I wanted to do. I um, finished my degree and then I actually did a second one in archaeology, really focusing on human osteology, which is the study of human bones. Uh, and then I spent five years doing various different archaeology jobs, just trying to learn everything that I could. And then I had the opportunity to apply it forensically. So it's the exact same skill set, the you know, same tools for the job. But instead of looking at 3,000 year old human remains from parts of the South Pacific, I was now looking at 50 year or even shorter, uh, you know, in terms of time of death. Um, bodies. And so that that's what got me really interested. And it, the great thing about, you know, doing school is that as you get further along in your studies, the more agency you may have in terms of deciding what you may want to do, uh, leading projects and, you know, really just trying to follow your interests. So, um, yeah, I, I love your work. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And can you describe a little bit of the field work that you did um, in archaeology school or what kind of what that field work consisted of, what, what exactly it was? Yeah, so when I was doing that, I was uh, traveling to places like Fiji and Tonga, um, and we would look at um, everything about a settlement site, including who lived there, what they were eating, uh, the types of ceramics that they were building. And the neat thing about some of those materials is that the, the materials that are needed to create those ceramics were actually sourced in other islands as to suggest how people were moving and even the technology that they were using. Um, you can see it be transferred uh, and then you can see breaks in that continuation. 
So being able to actually look at those pieces um, was really neat. And one of the cool things about a, a lot of the stuff we're looking at, they're all handmade. So sometimes you'll get fingerprints or impressions of people that made this pot, you know, thousands of years ago. And your hand, you know, you're, you're making that connection with the past. Um, so that's always been really neat. Uh, and in my current work, um, I, I do a little bit of everything <laughs> right now related to uh, body decomposition, but I'm really focused on um, how uh, aquatic environments impact the body differently and what we can tell um, and how we can detect these bodies using acoustic technology. So using different types of sonars. So um, that's really where the focus of my, my work is going towards, but I, I still work with bones when I can. Um, somebody in the uh, in the chat asked, um, what's something that uh, Margaret asked, have you ever not wanted to do a job that you had to do? Um, and in the entomology lab, we primarily work with insects from crime scenes. Um, and sometimes you're, you don't know what you're getting. <laughs> So it, the actual work isn't bad, but depending on how much material you're getting, you can be there. It's kind of like a, um, a plumber's coat for when they may come. Someone's going to show up within these like six hours. So you just have to wait <laughs> for, for the evidence to show up. And then depending on how big the case is, you are either going to be there for an hour to four or five hours. So there's a big range in um, how much time we'll be spending. And so um, part of that is that uncertainty. So um, it's really hard to make dinner plans with friends. Because <laughs> 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 I, I don't know when I'll be done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Awesome, all right, we'll move on to another question. Um, so Sarah, I'd love to hear um, if you've kind of realized throughout um, your work, um, is there one thing about your career that you really wish more people um, more people knew about? Um, so probably the main thing that I'd say is just more knowledge about like microbes and microbiology. Um, one of the things that I've like come to realize is that um, microbes are all around us. So bacteria are all around us and they're really actually essential to our well-being and our life. And one like piece of information that I think is really, really cool is that actually less than 1% of all bacteria cause disease. Um, so I just think that it's important for more people to kind of think about um, the importance of microbiology in our life. Awesome, thank you. And uh, I guess as a kind of follow up, um, also to the audience, thank you for your questions. Um, I am seeing them rolling in and we are loving the questions. Um, this one is kind of a direct tie in, I guess a little bit to, to your question, but for the audience, we'll try to get through them as well. Um, uh, after we've uh, run through a few more questions. Uh, but for Sarah as well, when you go in the cave, do you find crystals and old artifacts um, and in my, like in mines? And then what's the biggest, most coolest cave that you've been in? Kind of tying back to, yeah. So yeah. mostly what we find is not so many um, artifacts, but we do find lots of like crystals and uh, secondary like calcium deposits in caves. So we're mainly studying um, kind of, it's a confusing word, but it's called the biomineralization um, of caves. So it's bacteria producing crystals as like a byproduct of their metabolic waste. Uh, so we study those. So the, like the soda straws speleothems, which look like soda straws and they have like a very crystalline structure to them. And then also popcorn speleothems. So clearly whoever was naming these was very hungry. <laughs> um, but yeah, we find lots of those and that's mainly where our like, my sort of cave research comes into play. Yeah. And the coolest cave that I've been to is probably the Iron Curtain Cave in Chilliwack. It's the, it has this huge dark sort of abyss <laughs> for lack of a better word. And it's filled with water and um, it's said to be two times as big as I believe it's Rogers Stadium. So it's absolutely massive and people haven't even actually like fully explored the whole area, but it's it's gorgeous. And all the um, 
like calcite structures are stained red because it has such a high iron content. And then I'll just answer Maggie's question really quickly. What is microbiology? Um, so microbiology is the study of things that are too small to be seen with like your eye. So you have to use like a microscope to see them. So it can be like viruses, bacteria, some sorts of fungi, all that sort of thing. Sarah, are you scared of small places? No, I love small <laughs> places. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, funny enough, I used to, um, my brother and I used to like dig little snow pits, tiny little snow pits and just hang out in there for hours. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I like a nice, big, yeah. shiny laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very different preferences here that we have. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Jennifer, same question for you. What is one thing about your career that you wish more people um, knew about, uh, kind of maybe when you tell them what you do? Um, that it exists. Uh, I think that a lot of people don't realize um, what an essential service it is and the dignity that goes around serving your community in that way. Uh, there is such a need for it. Um, uh, we're part of people's, you know, worst days. Um, and we, it, the desire and want in every department and every person who does different things is to make those days just a little bit easier. And I think sometimes um, maybe in the past there was a CD carsman salesman mentality around the funeral industry, but there is a, a group of amazing people. And I, I started myself in the embalming area of the department, um, but I couldn't do that job. And um, the magicians like Athena who work in that area to that facilitate that process after someone passes away to allow someone to spend time with their loved one was magical. Like you'd see the, the transformation that allowed the family to spend time with someone they loved and grieved. So I think that I would like people to know that it exists and that it's honorable and that it's necessary. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and kind of leading off of that question for both Athena and Jennifer, do you um, have you encountered any kind of common misconceptions that people may have about your job? I know you mentioned about um, the this the sale like creepy salesman part. Um, but how do you think we can you combat you know any of the misconceptions that you've encountered and communicate more effectively? I think that one of the misconceptions I face daily with uh, families is people think that if you choose cremation, that you cannot have a service and that you cannot have a viewing. Yeah. Uh, cremation is a form of disposition, just like burial is. Burial cremation is the last part, but everything that happens before can, can happen. There's also a misconception um, that funerals are expensive. And I, I bring that up because as Jennifer said, it's a necessity, it is an essential service. Um, and it's interesting to see where people put value on what is important to them on a monetary level. Um, there are options for everybody, economical, uh, not economical, high end, whatever you want us to do. But I think that one of the misconceptions is that everyone thinks funerals are very expensive, that it's, it's completely unnecessary and it is very, very necessary to keep the traditions and the rituals and accept the fact that it is the inevitable for all of us. We will all, we all get to choose many things or most of us get to choose many things <laughs> in our life, um, but death is not one of them. It's, it's inevitable. And I, I, I agree with that. And I think what I would add on would be, um, a, I find that certain cultures in our community are, they're like, oh, I don't even want to come to the funeral home or I don't want to, no, I don't want to do this. Or I, there's, a, there's a tendency, I think, to push the actual death away to make it not exist. I think that's one of our first stages of grief is denial. So 
the importance of even if it's you and your family go to the park and have a mini memorial by yourself. Um, but I always encourage a, a, a viewing with the family when possible, just that what that does with the helps with the grieving process to have um, some type of actual event, whether exactly what Athena said, you're doing it in a, in a funeral home and spending a large amount of money, or you're doing it in a very economical way, all of it matters. Can yeah. I just add something here that it's very interesting that actually much of great art and great science comes from death and grieving and learning about it. And in fact, the basis of much of the scientific research, for instance, the blood circulation that I'm interested in, is because people dealt with death and took dead bodies and dissected them and learned how things function in the body. So a lot of Western science for sure and, and the greatest paintings were all based on dead bodies and what we learned from dead bodies. So knowing that is, is, is paramount. It's important for everybody and also accepting that. that was like really beautiful. Echo, what Jennifer said. Yeah, it was really beautiful. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Fiona, I have the same question for you um, to repeat the question, any kind of common misconceptions that have come up in your field or that people have? And um, how do you think we can combat these misconceptions and communicate uh, what you do more effectively? I think some people are concerned um, when we use, well, we normally use uh, animals um, proxies for research, or, but a lot of our work is related to insects. But um, you can be ethical um, about how you go about it and all the, like, the human remains that we have that we use to teach. These are people who donated their bodies. We didn't go and take it from a cemetery. We're not using unknown bodies. These are people that wanted to donate their body for science they wanted to still help teach uh, even after they passed away. So sometimes they're family members that have donated to instructors. Um, so they they come from somebody and, and it's so important that we really respect uh, these remains that we use um, to further our education and our knowledge. So um, that's a misconception that some people have, have made. Um, yeah, but it, not too common. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's not too common. And to add on to that, it's a beautiful thing that UBC does. What they do is, um, because Athena and I are part of this process, is they will uh, do a, a cremation for all of the people who donate their bodies to um, the, the, the science, and then they hold a memorial service for it. So for the families. And so it's a very lovely community thing that they respect them for. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds it sounds very special. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, so I have two more questions before we'll open it up to um, the uh, comments uh, from the audience. But thank you again. We are loving the questions. Keep them coming. Uh, so Sarah, um, I just wanted to know what uh, the biggest challenge in your field is that uh, you think um, at the moment? Um, so the biggest challenge that I'd say at the moment um, in terms of the like what I'm focusing on right now is probably uh, we're trying to find a, a sort of not a cure but a way to stop white nose syndrome in bats. So it's a, it's a sort of fungus that goes into um, bats immune system and it causes them to wake up uh, too early from their winter hibernation and so then they fly out of their caves or their hibernation state and then it's too cold for them so they die um so probably the biggest challenge right now is just all the variables that come with dealing with live animals um because they are like living animals and they're always changing and there's so many different things that we don't know about them it's really hard to develop a sort of cure um, and to really scientifically prove 
that it actually works. Like, for example, right now we're developing a sort of probiotic cocktail of these four different species of bacteria. And we're using that on the bat wings um, to inhibit the growth of what causes white nose and bats. So pseudogymnoascus destructans or PD for short is much easier. Um, yeah, so the big challenge is just dealing with live animals and all the variables that come with it. Very fair. And I'm sure there are lots of things changing too at the moment, like climate change is a big one. And I'm sure that's likely. Yeah. And not knowing what effect climate change will have on animals. And so, yeah. yeah very <laughs> Why do we put it on their wings? Why do we put it on their wings? Oh, no. How do you get it on their wings? How do you put it on their wings? Um, so I haven't actually been part of that sort of field research, but a lovely, wonderful lady that I work with, uh, Dr. Corey Lawson, she mostly focuses on that part. And so she catches the bats and um, in, in nets and stuff. And you can either like put the probiotic on or mainly what we're doing is we have sort of like captive trials uh, where we use bat boxes to put the probiotic in a clay mixture almost. And so the bats will go into the bat boxes and then they will move around in the bat boxes throughout hibernation or just hanging out there and the probiotic will go on their wings and kind of be like scraped off. And then through that, they can spread it to other bats in the environment because they're all so close and small. <laughs> I hope that helps. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Um, Maria, the same question for you. Um, what would you say is kind of the biggest challenge um, in your field at the moment? Well, before I answer that, Sarah, I'd just like to let you know that I have two bat boxes in my wow. garden. That's fantastic. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm very into bats. Love the little guys. So, uh, yeah, and I see them see them circling in the night in the summer. So, yeah, very That's cool. So great. So we all have connections, you know. Now, and I suppose that's the biggest challenge in my field: um, blood science, hematology, blood research, and all of you know all the good gory stuff is a huge field. It's incredibly challenging, and there are so many things happening so fast that keeping up is a marathon. And it's important to keep up and it's important to connect because other people's super interesting research will inform what you do. So staying on top of it and also getting all the right connections and talking to people and learning from other people and learning from other disciplines is probably the biggest challenge because the field of knowledge is so huge. And that's most, the most exciting part, of course, is because you're just learning. You're constantly sitting there going, oh, my God, this is so cool. And then maybe we could do this. Maybe, right, Vienna? I mean, don't you do that? Yep. <laughs> it definitely feels like there's so much that's being done, though, that it's easy to fall behind on your readings. <laughs> but it is so exciting to always be on the cusp of something new. Like, it's definitely not boring. It's definitely very interesting. And there's always something that's happening. Awesome, thank you. And then Maria, for the audience, could you also describe a little bit about what um, immunology and hematology is? I think, um, yeah, what are uh, just the one sentence description of what those are? Ooh, that's one sentence is hard, okay. <laughs> blood is the nice good red stuff when you poke yourself and it comes out. Um, hematology is the study of blood but currently hematology has expanded to study everything that has to do with blood and blood cancers. So uh, everything from lymphomas to you know, a whole bunch of things that constitute blood cancers, plus weird blood cells, uh, how blood cells are formed. Um, and this is just to do with red blood cells. Then immunology is a study of white blood cells to be exact and how the white blood cells go around and protect you. And the whole protection system is also related to blood because both the red blood cells that circulate and carry oxygen and the white blood cells that pro uh, protect you come from the bone marrow and grow out of the bone marrow and then expand 
into the blood system. So immunology studies how the protecting factors work and the protecting cells work. And hematology covers pretty much everything else. And then there's a special part of it which covers red blood cells or platelets or you know different components of blood or even the clotting factors in blood. So there's just so much, it's a huge field and it's grown in the last 20, 20 or so years enormously. Great, thank you so much. All right, everyone. So I think we'll probably save our very last question that I have for all of you for the end. We'll see if we have time for that. Um, but I wanted to move on to the comments and Q&A because we've just been having so many great comments from the audience. Um, and I'd love for um, the uh, the comments that are coming in to get answered. So um, mentors, if it works for you, maybe I could just read out the question and we could just do popcorn style if everyone wanted to um, answer for whoever um, whoever would like to. So the first question that I have is who inspired you to do the work that you do? If any, if anyone had any mentors or anyone that uh, really kind of was a formative person in their life. Well, I'm going to jump in here because it, for me, it was actually a, a negative thing. Um, I was pretty much being forced into doing fine arts and I just couldn't hack it. So I'll do anything else except, and I went and, well, when I did that, I pretty well had to succeed because I was, you know, sort of saying, no, I'm not doing what you're telling me to do. So then I went into science and I discovered that I just loved it. It was just, you know, crazy fun. So yeah, so much for fine art. Sorry, I still do art. Don't, don't get me wrong, but I wasn't going to study it. I was going to study science. So there you go. Negative. <laughs> I like to tell everybody I was headhunted because I was an employment company that <laughs> interviewed, asked me for the job. But really um, what made me passionate about it is my sister died when I was quite young and I was eight. And um, there wasn't um, a lot of education on how to deal with me back then. And so my grieving experience within my family uh uh, created some um, issues for me. And so as getting older, that was one of my focus was children and how to provide that support for children and to let people know it's okay to expose children to funerals. It's actually wonderful because then they have those memories and learn how to grieve when they get older. So the children are my mentors. That's really nice, actually. I love that. That's so sweet. Yeah. All right, if, um, I can move on to the next question. Um, so I think this might pertain to, to a few specific people, but if a body is found extremely decomposed, how do you identify the cause of death? Oh, Vienna. <laughs> well, there's a couple things um, I can talk about that. When you're describing death, really um, you're either describing the manner, the medical cause of death, or the mechanism or mode of death. Uh, manner is just classification. So some people have mentioned suicide, homicide, accidental. Like these are all just classifications of what that what could have happened. Whereas cause is specifically the medical cause. So this is uh, often determined um, by a pathologist and then it's coroners or medical examiners or death investigators that will use the advice of a pathologist to put together the death certificate. So medical cause, even when a body is really decomposed, you can get some information. You can get contextual information. Sometimes, especially with skeletons, um, even if the soft tissue, the soft parts of your body are highly decomposed, you can still look at the bones. Um, how forensic anthropologists, which are the people who are looking at those bones, deal with that is they'll first macerate the body. So maceration is, I don't know if anybody's ever done slow cooking on a crock pot. Um, it's similar to that <laughs> until all the soft tissue sloughs off the bone. <laughs> it's the same thing, but with humans. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> that's essentially that process. Um, and then you can do different things. Like there's an entire field of forensic anthropology called histology, which is where you take very thin sections of the bone so these are sometimes like 100 microns, which is the thickness of two hair strands on top of each other. So very, very, very thin. And then you 
use really high powered microscopes to look at structural changes. And sometimes that will give you clues as to what may have happened. Um, and you can also look at medical images. Um, so radiology in order to try to figure out what has happened to this person. So it's often a, a pathologist while they're doing the autopsy that will take a look at a lot of different clues to try to figure out what the medical cause is. But then there's an entire team of other types of scientists, depending on the case, that may jump in and actually give more uh, clues, depending on what, what's there, what, what you have to work with. Awesome. Thank you so much. Your, I think your crock pot example is something that's going to stick with me for a long time. That was a very apt, very apt analogy. <laughs> awesome. So the next question that I have for everyone or anyone that wants to answer, has there ever been a time where you wish that you had a different job? So maybe something that was really tough in um, your, your field. Yeah. No, loved every minute of it. Can't say that. I agree with Maria. Um, if you love what you do, even in the hardest parts and the most trying days and stressful, or even when mistakes occur that are beyond your control, unhappy people not giving results you want to give, even all the negative parts of a job, um, I've never felt differently about loving this job. I don't love uh, when the toilet overflows at work and I have to go and clean it, but I will, I will. Uh, but there are parts of the job that, you know, is not your favorite, but when you weigh out all of it, it's you do what you have to, because the end result is, is what you're, what you're going for. So when I first started working in the funeral industry, I, uh, it wasn't a plan of mine to do. And, um, uh, sorry, honey, can you turn the water off? And sorry. <laughs> and um, I was in a department called the service center where uh, deceased people would come in. And I have an amazing sense of smell, like a really good sense of smell. And because this wasn't something I grew up thinking of doing, and and I'm sure there's somebody here who who can talk about the changes that happen after someone dies and the smells that come up. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be honest. There was some first, in the first three or four months that I worked there, I wished I had another job because of the smells. <laughs> I could not handle it. <laughs> so I changed to a funeral home. I went to a different department. <laughs> Very fair. Very fair. I have to piggyback with you, Jennifer, on that one. It's always the smells that get to me. It's not <laughs> the, like the sight of something gross. It's the terrible smells that like even working with a mask, when they get through the mask, it's the worst. <laughs> yeah. Thank it's, goodness for respirators. respirators. There's that's definitely why I like working with, yeah, that's definitely why I like working with bones. <laughs> Because yeah. <laughs> they don't smell as much. <laughs> there are some smells that just there are some smells that just cannot be eliminated. <laughs> you know what though? But that goes with some other stuff too. I mean, before I did blood, I also worked in the um, in Saskatchewan looking with shipping fever and cows. Now a cow barn smell. Sorry, no. I'm really happy in a nice, clean laboratory. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh, awesome. Yeah. I'm I'm glad we all found a big commonality in smells <laughs> <laughs> in this group. <laughs> all right, and one last question from the from the chat: um, Is there any part? I know we talked a little bit about spooky parts, but is there any part of your job that has been creepy or you've been creeped out by? Well, <laughs> um, sometimes insects show up at viewings and I'm not really good with um, certain insects like maggots and 
I have had to remove some of those during a viewing so the family didn't see because they chose a preparation of the body that didn't help with uh, decomposite to slow the decomposition process. So therefore natural things happen. And so I had to remove some maggots during a time where a family was spending time with their loved one. Cause of course I would not want them to see. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, that, that I can still remember that exact moment when that happened. And my husband is cleaning the balcony <laughs> behind us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, this is strange, man. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. He's trying so hard to be quiet. Yeah, he's, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm glad it's a known person, um, not someone breaking in at a very inopportune time. <laughs> I'll piggyback with Jennifer. Creepy uh, maggots are just uh, an interesting, um, maybe one day there'll be a, a a maggot researcher on the program, but um, they're, they are sneaky and they are, are just where you never thought you'd find one. So they're all over the place. They are creepy. Uh, they have too many legs for me uh, or whatever they do. They squirm around. I don't like that. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't, I don't really like to think that funerals are creepy, but uh, there have been some, some weird uh, sometimes a weird sensation I have felt in the funeral home and I'm not creeped out by it because it's never been scary. It's been, I, it's hard to explain, but it's just a feeling. And so I sometimes do wonder and do feel that there is something else out there. I'm not going to get to X files on everyone, but it's just, it's a feeling. And I, I think it's, it's a nice feeling though. And so if you want to say that's creepy, maybe, but yeah, there's other, there's other things out there, but maggots uh, top the chart. Thank you so much. Awesome. So now I'll just wrap up with one final question to all of the mentor uh, mentors. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll call on each one of you individually for this question and just a sentence and sentence or two answer would be great. But um, Vienna, I will start with you if that's if that's okay. Um, but my question is, what advice would you give to someone or what advice would you give to the audience um, who wants to go and explore your field a little more? Uh, I think probably the first thing is to figure out if you're, hmm, <laughs> sorry, I got to think about that for a second. I, I think that the, one of the first things you should do is when you enter university is to figure out what your um, tolerance for the smells is, is one. And then two is to immediately contact somebody in the lab. Like I was very, um, you know, happy to hear that Sarah, even at second year, you're already working in a lab. I think that until you're actually doing the work, um, you may not know if this is something you can see yourself doing for a long time or where your passions are. Um, a lot of different universities will have these programs where they may be even able to pay you a little stipend to, to do some lab work. But if not, you can always try to volunteer as well. Like my first lab experience was I, I just want to get in. I just want to get some exposure and to work with this lab. So I was cleaning insect poo, actually. Um, so like insect cages, um, talking about like spooky <laughs> insects, but it was actually a really great experience. And it really taught me a lot uh, about how research works, what that side of academia looks like. Because when you're just in school as a student, you don't see really all the other things that are happening at the same time. So, um, yeah, and it's okay if you don't, you're not expected to be an expert. You're not expected to be, you know, like even necessarily like the top student. You just have to show up and be enthused and be on time <laughs> and really make sure, you know, you're, you're whatever it is that um, you're, you're putting your heart into it, even if it's something like cleaning insect cages. <laughs> so, yeah, that's. That's my advice. Get into a lab, any lab, and um, try to stick around for a semester and then do several of them just so you get a feel for all the different fields that are out there. Um, so you're not just staying in one place, you really get good exposure.
Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next up is Athena. Uh, same question. Any advice for our audience? Uh, yes. Advice I would say is get your driver's license when you're able to because funeral service requires you to drive. Um, but I also, as Vienna had mentioned, sometimes you're, you think you want to do something and you're just not sure. So if anyone's interested, uh, call up a funeral home, call me up anywhere, uh, you know, just ask questions to a funeral director, ask what the day-to-day -day life is, and even work part-time in a funeral home doing receptionist work or cleaning vehicles, driving. Um, so you're not really fully in it at the time, but you can see, is this really going to be for me? It's long hours. It is hard uh, mentally and emotionally draining sometimes, uh, physically as well. Uh, but it isn't, it, it is an incredibly rewarding job. And if you feel like you want to contribute to society and you want to help people, I would say this is an excellent profession to get involved in. Great, thank you so much. Jennifer, you're up next. What, everything that Athena just said, and I'll just, uh, there's the great resource of the FS, FAS, FSABC. BCFA. The, the VC, but she said, it's a British Columbia <laughs> Funeral Association. Go check out their website. And she said it perfectly. All right, I think that was BCSA. <laughs> anyone wanted to, yeah, if anyone wants to check it out. Thank you so much, Jennifer. <laughs> and Sarah, <laughs> what about you? Any um, advice for anyone? Um, I would say the same thing that Vienna and Athena said contact people, ask as many questions as you possibly can. Um, when I started my research, I was fresh out of high school and I started volunteering and I just read a ton of material, contacted, took a chance. That's the best advice I can give. Just contact people, talk to people, start a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And then last but not least, you have Maria. I'm going to give you the standard science answer, and, and but maybe with a twist. First of all, know if you really do like science and do you like solving problems and are you interested in answering questions? If you know if you're like a real snoopy curious person like I am, that works. So, um, like all the other mentors said, find out, figure it out, and and see if that is for you and try it volunteer, talk to people, and also figure out what you don't want. Because there are some, there are some aspects of every job that you really cannot handle. I remember Jennifer was saying earlier that there was a place, you know, the, the smell, she just couldn't take it. And it's fair. You don't have to be able to take every part of it. Figure out what you want and figure out what you don't want. And somewhere in between those two, you will find your happy spot. So go for that. And whatever you do, do it 100%. Don't hold back because then you'll never really know if you gave it an honest try. So, you know, go for it. Awesome. Thank you so much to all the mentors. All of that advice was um, very meaningful, very beautiful. Um, yeah, and I'm hearing, I'm not hearing, I'm seeing really great things in the comments as well from all of you. But it does look like uh, we're almost at time here. Um, and yeah, to our audience, we really want to thank you again for joining us today and um, asking a lot of questions in the comments. We really, really appreciate uh, all your participation. A huge thanks to all of our wonderful mentors for sharing their time and experience with us. Uh, we really, really appreciate hearing all of your perspectives. Thank you so much to our lovely interpreter here as well. We really appreciate your time here too. If you're interested in information about more events like this in the future, you can visit uh, the Science World website, uh, www.scienceworld.ca slash today slash events. Um, and hopefully that will pop up in the comments very soon there. Um, yeah, no worries. And then more Girls in STEAM events. We actually also have our main Girls in STEAM virtual conference coming up on November 6th. And we have a bunch of activities and over 50 mentors from all over STEAM fields. Uh, so there's also also a website in the uh, comments box there. So I encourage you to check that out as well. Otherwise, thank you so much to everybody. Um, and yeah, hope you have a lovely, lovely day and a lovely uh, upcoming weekend.
Bye, everyone. Thanks for having Bye. us. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs>